Every day, something dramatic happens in the Caribbean that affects our lives. We'll give you the details. We'll give you the facts on Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Fedrick. How's Eddie Fedrick? So glad you can join us. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank records a loss in excess of $50 million for 2022. This story takes the lead in today's edition of Caribbean Perspective for Friday, 7th July, 2023. Details after this important message. Hubbard's Multi Department, Mount Gay, and Hubbard's Tire Bay, located at the Building Supplies Compound in Grand Anse, are reminding the motoring public that another round for licensing and inspection has begun. Just arrived are new shipments of quality furrowed and torque tires to fit all makes and models of vehicles at competitive pricing. Shop early to avoid the hassle of long lines. WhatsApp them on 473 405 5482. Hubbard's Quality Service, Affordable Prices. Welcome back. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the ECCB, says it has recorded a net loss of $54.5 million for the 2022-2023 to financial year, a $5.4 million increase over the previous financial year. Andre Huey of SKN Newsline reports. The ECCB stated this in its published annual report and financial statements for the financial year ended March 31st, 2023. The ECCB said the deteriorated performance was largely driven by significant losses on foreign investment securities as interest rates in the United States rose dramatically from near zero over the financial year. The governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Timothy Antoine, said the 2023 to 2024 financial year will be a bounce back year for the bank due to the projected slowdown or cessation of interest rate hikes by the U.S. Federal Reserve and elevated interest rates. Governor Antoine confirmed that the bank remains ever more committed to advancing its strategic goals in support of its member countries, which continue to face an extremely challenging economic and policy environment. During the 2022 to 2023 financial year, the ECCB advanced a number of key initiatives guided by its 2022 to 2026 strategic plan. These included development of a payment system, vision, and strategy for the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, laying the groundwork for the establishment of an Office of Financial Market Conduct and continuous strong surveillance and vigilance, which has resulted in the maintenance of resilience and stability of the ECCU financial sector. Looking ahead, Governor Antoine calls for a big push across the region. This big push, he says, is a call to implement innovative and transformative policies and initiatives to double the size of the ECCU economy for the benefit of the people of the region. I'm Andre Huey for SKN Newsline. Venezuela's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Raul Icausi, has praised the Trinidad and Tobago for its role in ensuring both countries can collaborate in the energy sector. TTT's Sunil Lala reports. Mr. Likausi, who was speaking at the ceremony to commemorate the 212-year independence anniversary for the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela at its embassy in Trinidad on Wednesday, thanked this country, and by extension CARICOM, for what he noted as interference from the United States. To recognize the role that Trinidad has played uh, defending Venezuela on the uh, sanctions, unilateral coercive measures that are not only to our country but also in Cuba. But these kind of measures that have stopped us of being working already together in exploding the dragon field. But the role of Trinidad and CARICOM has been leading in this fight for principles of stopping the interference from the United States. Mr. Likausi also noted collaboration between Venezuelan and TNT media. As we're speaking right now, Telesur and Trinidad and Tobago Television are about to sign a memorandum of understanding that will facilitate the exchange of television programs and best practices, which in turn will enhance the acknowledgement and flow of information in the whole Latin American and Caribbean region. Sonolala, TTT News. President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Christine Kangaloo, has called on CARICOM leaders to keep pressing forward, even as they gathered to celebrate the golden jubilee of the signing of the Treaty of Chagaramas. TTT News has more. The president noted that although in biblical times, the 50th anniversary heralds a period of relaxation, it would not be so for this region. This is no time to rest. This is the time for CARICOM to regroup and work even harder, guiding ourselves by the old adage that the only reward for good work is more work. 
Quoting from Black Starling's Caribbean Unity, President Kangaloo said CARICOM leaders need to make a better life for the people of the region. And so let us toast to continued Caribbean cooperation and unity, to further and deeper integration of our structures and institutions, and to the prosperity and well-being of all our peoples and nations. The presidential reception for CARICOM leaders, the diplomatic corps, and other specially invited guests was held at President's House on Monday evening. As the United States Secretary of State was due to arrive in Trinidad and Tobago for the CARICOM conference, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has called for a further relaxation of U.S. sanctions on Venezuela to allow the region to benefit from the better oil and gas supply arrangements. This includes Trinidad and Tobago's drag and gas deal with Venezuela. TV6's political editor, Jewel Brown, has that story. Caricom heads of government, including Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley, were at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Port of Spain on day two of the 45th regular meeting where tributes were paid to Caricom by its international partners, such as the United Kingdom, Canada, China, and South Korea, on Caricom's 50th anniversary. The United States has also had a long-standing relationship with CARICOM. While speaking with the media at the Hyatt Regency Hotel on Tuesday, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez fielded a question about a matter deliberated on by the CARICOM heads at their 44th regular meeting in February in the Bahamas, where they agreed that in the context of the bilateral relationship with the U.S., to urge for the removal of the U.S. sanctions on Venezuela regarding the Petro-Caribbean Initiative and for further progress on the exploration of the cross-border natural gas fields between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. I can't allow the foreign policy of St. Vincent Grenadines to be imprisoned by American domestic politics. So, and when they tell me that the struggle in the world is between democracies and autocracies, you buy that. The struggle in the world is for resources who control them and how those resources are distributed. Prime Minister Gonzalez expressed his views the day before U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is to arrive in Trinidad and Tobago for the CARICOM conference. Prime Minister Gonzalez made reference to the impact Russia's war with Ukraine has had on global oil and natural gas supplies as he spoke about the two-year provisional license granted by the U.S. to Trinidad and Tobago with regard to the Dragon natural gas field in Venezuela's waters. They give permission to Chevron to talk to Venezuela about exploiting resources and paying Venezuela in U.S. dollars. But yet, you don't want Venezuela to do it with Petro Caribbean. Huh? And that you're still saying, well, Trinidad can go and do a deal with Venezuela. But we're not so sure if you could pay them in US dollars. While Prime Minister Gonzalez said St. Vincent and the Grenadines has excellent relations with the U.S., he added that as the leader of a small island state, it is his job to point out what he termed these inconsistencies. They went to talk to Maduro, despite they saying that Maduro and the president, that it is um, it's Guaido. Guaido control any oil field. <laughs> So is that the position, if you have any talks with the U.S. Secretary of State tomorrow, would that be the kind of position in terms of things like petro the dragon deal that Trump and Tobago has with Venezuela, we talk with them. We talked with them about that already. The question is this. Does reason always persuade power to act as far as they are concerned, contrary to their own national interest? A State Department official said last week that the U.S. is certainly open to further conversations with Trinidad and Tobago on this issue to see what can be done to improve energy security in the region. Jewel Brown, TV6 News. You're listening to Caribbean Perspective with Eddie Frederick. The CARICOM community is very beneficial to the Caribbean region, and one expert is suggesting accelerated integration to increase those benefits. This, as the CARICOM heads of government were in Trinidad and Tobago to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the organization. 
TV6's Nicole M. Romani has more. Gervais Warner, chairman of the CARICOM private sector organization and CEO of Massey Holdings, describes it as one of the longest standing organizations to date. It's the longest standing integration movement in the developing world and the uh, second largest in the entire world, second only to the European Union. And so we've had a long time that we've been at it and significant progress. I mean, well, you know, uh, congratulations and, and, and uh, salute must be paid to the founding fathers. Uh, he notes the many advantages and challenges to member nations, especially to this country. Countries like Trinidad and Tobago, to be honest, have been huge beneficiaries with its strong manufacturing sector exporting into uh, other CARICOM countries. Uh, so, so, you know, I think you're right. Yes, they are, they, you know, they, there is a, a, a wide opening. But I, I think it would be remiss of us not to admit that there are some challenges, um, for example, transportation and, and shipping lines that still remains um, uh, something that we could definitely look for improvements on. Uh, in some instances, there are non-tariff barriers that arise um, based on arcane laws and books or based on um, processes, administrative processes that make it challenging for some. Mr. Warner notes that while some decisions take a while to be finalized through CARICOM, it is both a complicated and a democratic process that takes time. However, he says, implementation will be key as we navigate the future. For sure, under certain, we can expect <clears throat> volatility in the future. Uh, to survive and thrive, I think we as a, we as a group of CARICOM need to, I think, lean more heavily into the initiatives that we have, many of, the, many of which we have on the table. I think that um, implementation is something that has always uh, um, really kind of bedeviled us. Um, strong decision making is absolutely necessary. I think that uh, certainly from a private sector perspective and the creation of the CPSO, we're bringing some uh, level of uh, support. The chairman of the CARICOM private sector organization has this message for the skeptics who question the value of CARICOM. I would say to my, my, my friends who see that it's not delivering and it's not working, that, yep, you're right, there are a lot of places where it's not working and it's not delivering. What, what are we going to do about it? I think what we should do about it is we should, you know, get our hands and hearts into this and help uh, move it forward. Nicole M. Romney, TV6 News. Lincoln Bain and other members of the Coalition of Independence staged a protest at the office of the Prime Minister in the Bahamas against the Immigration Minister. Carla Palmer of ZNS News has more. Whether they had anticipated it or not, the demonstrators were greeted by barricades and high-ranking uniformed police officers who stopped them in their tracks from getting anywhere close to the office of the Prime Minister's building. By the dozens, those demonstrating showed up in solidarity with one objective in mind. We are here today because we want Keith Bell to be terminated. Although organized by the Coalition of Independence, its leader and spokesman Lincoln Bain touted the event, a bipartisan effort, on behalf of the Bahamian people. We believe that what uh, the Minister of Immigration did uh, was, was illegal, that it was wrong, it was unlawful, it was ultra-virus, and any words that you want to put on it, and we're here to stand up. He has already doubled down and said that he is not resigning. He must be terminated. And it is the job of a leader to take tough decisions. And we're calling on Philip Brave Davis to take the tough decision and terminate him. With a view that the Bahamas should be for Bahamians first, Bain is adamant that he is not xenophobic. We're not against any race of people. All we are saying is come the right way. We know that we only Bahamians can be in this country. We need your help building our country. We need you to do some jobs that we are unable to do. But we want you to come the right way. We have a nation within a nation. And this is what we have to stop. We just want order in our country. When asked about the ongoing calls for Minister Bell's resignation, Acting Prime Minister, the Honorable Chester Cooper, responded this way. 
Minister, Minister, Minister Bell has the support of Prime Minister Davis. Bain and his team had hoped to submit their letter recommending the Minister of Labor's resignation into the Prime Minister's office, but was refused entry to the grounds. While Assistant Police Commissioner for Public Safety and Community Policing Services, Craig Stubbs, as well as several other officers offered to hand in the letter, Bain refused to hand it over. For the Bahamas tonight, I'm Carla Palmer. <laughs> There are strong winds, rooftops, and other debris are often blown about and can cause great damage. I am Eddie Frederick, wishing you a restful weekend. This has been Caribbean Perspective, a whole new approach to highlighting developments in the Caribbean. In the meantime, please continue to log on to CaribbeanPerspective.com for more daily news and more.